And in my beginning thoughts uh, that uh, Press Jones and Cecil Pruitt stopped me on the road uh, when you know, knew one another well, but anyway, they stopped me up here about the entrance to the cliffs and uh, asked me if I'd help them start a fire department. When I bought tracts of land, I bought two tracts and put them together, and there was no development here, absolutely nothing. The fire department hadn't even been anticipated, wasn't even discussed. We were, after we'd moved in, we were building a driveway to get around to the top of the mountain. Uh, he had driven the Volkswagen Beetle up to the house that he had just had serviced. And we worked hard all that day, uh, cutting trees and cl clearing timber. We came back that afternoon and we're sitting there uh, drinking water and I smell gas. And I, I kind of looked under the, the back of the, the Volkswagen and said, Pop, you, Volkswagen's leaking gas. So uh, Pop got in the thing, cranked it up, caught on fire. And I, I said, Pop, get out of there. The thing's on, on fire. And it was, we were used to, we were thinking, you know, the TV where the car's going to explode, you know, and the whole, whole thing. That was my first experience with uh, realizing we didn't have fire protection. But my, my neighbor from down the hill was R.Q. Barnett, who was one of the, the founding fathers of the fire department, of Glass Mountain Fire Department. He came to me, I don't know, a couple of months later and says, you know, we're thinking about forming a, a fire department. And I said, where do I sign up? Well, the reason we, insurance, we, get, we built a house in 81 and we couldn't get any insurance because there was no fire department here. And uh, that lady, we had every, Thing, you know, in our house, and so we couldn't, didn't have any fire protection. So that's when they decided to form a fire department. Well, Press and Cecil both told me if, if I said, if you'll donate the land for it, we'll, we'll help you get something started. And, and I said, well, I'd be willing to do that. So that was <clears throat> sitting there in the road about the entrance to the, uh, cliffs at Glassy now, even though there were not a cliffs at that time. Um, well, that wasn't too much longer. After that, RQ comes to me and says, we need volunteers for the fire department, you know, folk that actually gonna go out and fight fire. So I said, RQ, count me in, man. You know, so, so I wound up being in the first uh, class of interior structure firefighters. Uh, we went through the, the training and uh, we'd roll on calls and my wife wound up being a volunteer too. She was pregnant for the first class so she couldn't couldn't be in the first class but she went through the second class and it was uh, it was just a bunch of uh, people that realized that we had a need and we, we all pulled together. You know, when we call, and I always resented it, and I'd tell the news media, I resent being, you know, you're calling us no man's land. And that's what, where they had us listed as no man's land. And I said, where do you come up with no man's land? I think it's good land. And uh, they said, no, not having any fire protection whatsoever, you're in no man's land. Now, how did we do it? Well, that's interesting because none of us had ever put a fire department together before. I can tell you that. You know, my dad was police chief in Greenville, so he had 43 years. I had a grandfather as chief, two chiefs before him. My uncle happened to be assistant fire chief in Greenville. My other two uncles were firemen. So I had a little bit of family resources to draw on. At least I could call and say, hey, who does so-and-so? When I started here, I figured it was going to be a typical volunteer fire department, and that's what it is, and who should? You know, who shows up for the day will show up, and who can help will help. And Press uh, Jones and uh, Cecil Pruitt were really interested, and they were really doing some work. And we, we had to <clears throat> beg every dollar that we could get, and equipment, and whatever. Cecil was our first volunteer fire uh, department leader, the chief and uh, then he became, I think, the paid one for, for a period of time. But that, that was, mostly he was volunteer. 
Cecil was a magnetic, wonderful preacher uh, up in this area, beloved by everybody, had his own little church, uh, which I've been to several times, but was so community invested and inspired. You know, he was about six feet. He's kind of a robust kind of guy, a real, uh, you know, outdoorsy kind of man. Um, never met a stranger, uh, kind of talked like this, uh, which I, I can do in a minute. Uh, you have to make myself not, not do it, except if I want to do it, because it's probably the way I really talk. But uh, he, he, he knew, knew everybody. But in the meantime, uh, Cecil and uh, uh, Cecil Pruitt and Press Jones was out begging equipment. And uh, they uh, getting donations from other fire departments and whatever and started getting a little bit of uh, equipment together. And the uh, more they worked at it, the more we accumulated the junk from other fire departments. And, and but filed him away as a, I love characters. I love people who are characters, people who do great things, people who, who will go where others dare not tread, people who go the untraveled path, uh, particularly in the good of the community. Cecil was one of those people. He would go an unmarked trail. If somebody said this is something that could help the community, Cecil would get his machete, so to speak, figuratively, and he would go down that trail. Press Jones was the radio man. Um, took care of programming all, all the radios when we first got them, you know, and, and radios was new for all of us. But Press was the guy that, that I mean, Press, uh, in fact, Press was sort of the first money guy. Um, he, was, he was real hard on making sure that, that we didn't go into debt and um, make sure that the expenditures that were made were, were prudent. Uh, Press was a great guy. There's many a times, you know, nobody had cell phones in those days. A lot of people didn't even have landlines. So if you wanted to get something to somebody, you'd just get in your little car and drive around and hope you could find their house. You wouldn't get shot, the dog wouldn't bite you, and you could, you, could, you could get in. And so I would go to Cecil's house sometimes when I had papers. Remember, I was assigned with doing the tedious work, drawing up stuff, getting our permits, lots of stuff to do, as you would imagine. Uh, and so I would go down and I needed him to sign. We always made two people sign. And I would go to his house and toot. So there's many times I would go toot out, and, you know, toot toot out in front of his house and he would come out or tell me when his wife would say when he's going to be there. And that's kind of how we got stuff done. I mean, if there's anyone deserves the most credit whatsoever, it was Press Jones and Cecil Pruitt. John Hip was one of the founders of the Glassy Mountain Fire Department. He was around a long time. What was it, 16 years, you say, where he sat on the board? John worked with Dick and et cetera, so he got to know him real well. And that's how I got to know John, and we talked, you know, what he did with Grace and Company and where he went and who he knew and et cetera, and the time he spent in the service and all the other parts of his life. Uh, going back to forming the fire department, they was having meetings, you know, at church, different churches, trying to get people interested in it. And when he had his heart attack, he was doing the program for that night at the church of Oak Grove. So that, that's, that was his last business that he had taken care of. And then when he passed away, I was gonna run for a commissioner, which I did, and I think it was four years I served then. When we all had expertise I mean, everybody pitched in where they could. Um, I was the secretary, I wasn't really the treasurer, um, but I, I kept minutes and kept notes. And, um, one of the, one of my proudest things for the fire department was uh, I filed the first ISO application to get us an ISO rating, because we didn't have an ISO rating. You know, and that was an education. Paul Bishop and I sat in my uh, living room at home and filled out the application. And that was sort of an, an interesting deal too, is who, who's gonna be the chief? You know, because we're just a bunch of people that are, that are trying to build a fire department. As we began to grow, uh, grow both uh, with equipment, uh, we were able to house things in the facilities that we had. Mountain Station came on, so we had three, uh, three full bays there that we could house equipment in. Uh, building out and improving the equipment. You have to understand that in 1996, a lot of what we had at Glassy Mountain was hand-me-down equipment, either from other fire departments or from 
companies, oil companies. We used to haul water in refurbed tankers that hauled fuel oil. So one of the events we had as we were struggling along for a little while was a uh, cake sale, um, a Mr. Glassy Mountain, and by that we had a beauty pageant. And in the beauty pageant, we let no women be in the beauty pageant. Now this is separate from little Mr. or Miss Glassy Mountain. We did a beauty pageant and the contestants were all male. So I, I entered this young boy that I had the only control over in my life and it was my son. He was only like four years old. He didn't really know what he was walking into. He ended up being uh, the first little, but not miss, little Mr. Glassy Mountain. So he's Jay Jennings Gresham, and he was four years old, and he, he got a little banner and wouldn't refuse to wear it. They had a little tiara, refused to wear it. He wasn't very cooperative either. So he became the first uh, little Mr. Glassy Mountain. I was always proud of that, and I told him, thank you. I was at Wade Hampton uh, working that morning. I had my radio with me, heard Glassy dispatched to a call, and of course would turn my ear to, to that sort of thing when I heard it on the radio. And uh, the dispatch kept calling for Glassy Mountain and there was no response. And having come through the EMS system and been in public service here, I knew the dispatchers, so I called them on a private unrecorded line and uh, uh, Gene uh, Slattery answered the phone. I said, Gene, this is Brian. And she simply said, Brian, I'm so sorry. I uh, walked right into my uh, chief's office. I said, Chief, I've got a problem at Glassy. And uh, he said, leave. And so that long ride from Way down to Boulevard, Pine Old Drive area up here was a very, probably one of the longest drives in my life. Uh, ben Graydon, the chief, was there. Mickey Thomas was one of our captains. He was there. Um, I, I'll forget somebody if I try to recall all the names that were standing at the intersection of, of Beaver Dam, excuse me, Dividing Water and Old 25 that day. But it was a very, it was a very, uh, very tough time for this young agency, it really was. Um, Jack and his wife were scheduled to go to the doctor that, that day. Uh, she was expecting, later found out that they were, um, she was carrying twins. Um, and uh, again, right here in this same room, uh, it was the second line of duty death I'd had in my young career. I can remember standing in that space that day in August, uh, facing that wall over there and just simply saying, I'm not sure I can do this anymore. But uh, with God's grace and with help, we were able to make it through, pulled everybody up. We got a lot of support. There was support from the local chiefs, uh, Spartanburg County chiefs. We got support from the state and just a, uh, a, a heartfelt send off to one, uh, our Captain Jack Caps. What did, in your mind, what could you imagine the fire department becoming in the future? What was your vision for it? Well, I didn't think it would ever be what I think it is now, but, uh, but I was hoping that we would get something that would care for, would really be a help to some degree of, of where we are at it, to this day and time. But that was my vision that we needed it here. Well, I would hope that the folks that, that move into the, the area now uh, would take some time and, and think about where we came from and maybe look at some of those documents that you've got to talk about those first tax collections and, and pictures of the hot dog sales and uh, yard sales and just realize that today we've got it a whole lot better today because because of a lot of work that a lot of people did through the years but but especially the the folk that started the thing I'd hope that people would would remember uh, 
folks that cared enough about the community and, and helping each other. And, and I really hope we never lose that kind of spirit up where we are, because it's the thing that's always made where we are special, is that folks care about each other. Well, it, there, there's no ends if or buts about it. It, it is, in, and let's face it, you do you have people with it, had, you know, business sense and were involved with it there. And that's the only way you make things, you know, go. And also, how you make things go that people are dedicated. And dedication to me is the most important thing. That when you do something, you stay dedicated to it. Not that you throw it on the corner somewhere. But everybody brought their talents. And, and, and if you had little bitty talents, not much talent over here, but you thought you had talent, but everybody else knew you didn't, then you still put together whatever it was. And it not only became a joyful noise, it became an explosion. I mean, I think this fire department's phenomenal and can be more phenomenal by just keeping on the vision. Think big, never think little. Think outside the box. Uh, just pretend that box is burning and you're gonna be thinking outside that box and that's what you can accomplish, everything. For over 30 years, the Glassy Mountain Fire Service Area has provided its very best service to those who live and visit its beautiful 52 square mile district. From its humble beginnings with used apparatus, eager volunteers, little funding, and much determination, the firefighters of the Glassy Mountain Fire Department have always strived for excellence. When I began as chief in 2013, the district looked much different than it did when the department began. The needs of the community are constantly changing and the department is changing with it. When our residents demanded a higher level of emergency medical care, we evolved once again. We now proudly offer our citizens advanced life support at the paramedic level. Through strong leadership and visionary thinking of the commissioners, chiefs, and firefighters of the Glassy Mountain Fire Department, we have formed a strong emergency services organization. With highly trained personnel in both fire and emergency medical services, the department is prepared to respond to events we pray will never happen. For many years, our district has been known as the dark corner. The residents and visitors of our district love the seclusion and beauty that this title holds. With great devotion to preserving our heritage and protecting our future, the Glassy Mountain Fire Service Area continues to be the heart of the dark corner.